Welcome to Fort Knox. Man, I'm busy today. Uh, and I am with the CEO of StockX, Scott Cutler. And uh, I want to dive in. Welcome uh, with, the, with the question I always start with, Scott, and that is what is the toughest problem that you are solving for today? Well, you know, as a as a com company that represents current culture and as a company that's been growing and executing through the pandemic, um, you know, I think it's obviously our responsibility to deliver a great experience for our customers. And, you know, as a CEO of an organization that has operations around the world and customers in over 200 countries and territories around the world, it's it's a, it's a challenge in both having, you know, keeping our team safe during this environment and being able to operate a company to deliver the customer experience that not only that our customers expect, but, but that we really want to deliver for our customers. And it's been a very unique environment over the last, you know, year for us as a company, not only the, pan the pandemic, working in a virtual world, having a significant amount of our team on the front line, but also being in the middle of current culture where what we see around us with social injustice and the challenges that we see out there in society to impact our team, impact our customers, you know, and so it's uh, maybe that's everything you hear from everybody leading through the pandemic. But for us, it's really about, you know, being in the middle of that um, from a cultural perspective. Yeah, that's a lot. Let me take it from the <clears throat> product point of view yeah. first. We're in this supply constrained environment, which I imagine might increase demand for a service like StockX, where you know maybe you can't get as much new stuff if you're looking for something special. Um, somebody's already got inventory. Uh, you guys are, you know, authenticating merchandise as well. What kind of impact have you seen on demand from end users in this environment? It yeah, you know, the difference between StockX and a brand or a or a company that produces its own product and you're reliant on supply chain that could be everything from design to manufacturing to you know product and inventory that's on shipping containers sitting off the the, the port of LA right now. We're a marketplace that enables sellers to match with buyers, but once that happens on our platform, the seller sends that item to us, to an authentication center. We authenticate that and then we send it directly to the buyer. And it involves more of a reliance on transportation partners delivering individual parcels than it does for a very deeply connected supply chain that's on container ships of items that are moving across, you know, across oceans. So we have we have customers both buyers and sellers that are distributed around the world, but ultimately we connect them, you know, through individual, you know, packages. So in one sense, we're not immune to the supply challenges that face the industry and the brands that are very popular on our site. But when it comes to delivering the experience, um, it's not as much of an issue. And, and one thing that really highlights that it's, it, it's interesting is that when you think about it from a brand perspective, you release product in all these different regions around the world. And to the extent that product is available and on the shelf in Asia, our, our sellers, our entrepreneurs can procure that product in Asia and deliver it to a buyer where maybe that product actually didn't get released in, in America because of all the supply challenges that the brand had. Uh, and so we we kind of are able to leapfrog, I guess, some of those some of those challenges that yeah. others experienced. Uh, do you experience though? I mean, I know you have some standard ways of charging. How StockX makes money? Um, does inflation affect you because of a lack of overall product supply in the environment? Like, even if demand goes up, right, and even if items are selling for more on the marketplace, um, if shipping is costing more, um, if uh, employees are harder to retain and you need to re raise salaries, is there some pressure within to, to somehow optimize and, and change the way you charge? Well, you know, our, as, as you look at the competition for labor, you know, that, that's certainly in technology and in supply chain and in our operations 
something that we've continued to face. And so we've we've done a lot of work to make sure that that we're compensating and rewarding our team in those in those areas um, at, at you know very competitive market rates. I think from a from a shipping perspective, you know, we have more optimized the relationships we have with now multiple different transportation providers to to manage that cost to deliver in a, in a way that we don't so we don't have to pass on all of those costs to you know to our customers. So for example, our the the rate that we've charged for shipping on our platform, you pay for shipping on our platform has remained constant through that uh, through the through the pandemic. But for us, ultimately, it's about optimizing that experience to be able to get product to that customer as fast as we can. And our best way of doing that happens to be the cheapest way as well, which is matching supply and demand in a local market. And while we operate this global platform, we also have a very unique uh, process to match supply and demand in a local market, which is which is a unique thing that we can do as a as a marketplace. Tell me more about that. What's what's how does that work? So, you know, so, for example, if you have a you know, we, we we use stock market mechanics to match a buyer and a seller. And the easiest way to explain it is, you know, a, a sneaker will trade at the point of, you know, the lowest price at which somebody is willing to sell something for an ask. And the lot and the highest price that somebody is able to bid on a, on a product, or they're willing to pay. And when those things match, you know that's a trade, and that's how stock markets and and sophisticated markets have have worked uh, for hundreds of years. Um, but if our seller was located in the United States, and our buyer, for example, is located in the UK, that buyer might actually have to pay. Uh, uh, customs and duties associated with a product going across uh, the ocean. And so what we've been able to do is effectively incorporate into our matching algorithm the fully loaded cost associated with getting a product based on where you are. And so what you see as a buyer is the price based on where you're located and that ask that you might be looking at, which is the price that a seller is willing to sell for, represents where that ask would be would be located. We don't tell you that that ask is in the UK or or in LA, but you but you see actually the price associated with what you're going to pay for it. And so our matching in effectively does that. And when we when we turn that experience on and we have an authentication center in a region and we're able to match those trades, what happens is naturally because of those costs, you match more trades between buyer and seller in a local market because there's less landed costs that the buyer would ultimately experience. And so local suppliers are preferenced from pricing in our, in our uh, algo uh, based on that experience. Huh. Wow. Fascinating. Pretty um, technical, but <laughs> no, I mean, it works. Yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Um, tell me about, of course, sneakers are sort of the, the root base product uh, that StockX became known for, but you expanded into electronics recently. Why? Did PS5 and Xbox have anything to do with it? Well, we, our platform, what, who we are as a trusted global platform for consuming and trading current culture. Um, and so as we look at current culture, this is the, 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 the cultural zeitgeist. And this is powered by the billions of dollars that are spent by brands across multiple categories uh, that drive consumer interest, but it's amplified in this world by influencers, by celebrities and by athletes uh, that, that, that give even more provenance to what is great product from a, from a brand. Um, and so our reason for expanding into other categories, we actually now call them energy categories. Uh, these are the categories that are apparel, accessories, uh, collectibles, trading cards, electronics. What we found is that since our consumer is essentially a Gen Z, Gen Y consumer under the age of 35, and that's a majority of our customer, they were also gamers. Uh, they were they're they're into uh, that, and so when we introduced electronics into the catalog, it was very natural for that Gen Z, that Gen 
that that generation of consumers say, "Well, oh, this is a product that I I really want." We introduced that into the into the catalog, and you know we became a top de destination last year for trading uh, consoles, the PlayStation and the Microsoft uh, uh, Xbox consoles. And then in the last year, we've been expanding expanding the number of brands and items that would be in that category of electronics that appeal to our core our core customer. Now, tell me about the cultural piece that you alerted uh, alluded to earlier and the impact on employees and sort of what's been going on in society and maybe uh, a, a sense of the diversity of your employee base um, and, and where your employees are based uh, as a part of, of laying that out. So when you look at our employee base, we're a global company. And so we have operations all over the world. In fact, we have 11 authentication centers. Six of them are in the United States. Um, you know, two are in Europe and three are in APAC. And we have team members that are in all of those different locations. Uh, but we're also a, a customer, you know, we're also look at our customer base and our customer base um, is that younger generation. And that younger generation is very much impacted by all of the social causes that are really important today and that are getting all of the headlines. And so as a company, we have, you know, make sure that we reflect uh, in what we do and what we back and what, what's important to us. And in terms of what we support, what we stand for, um, because it's really important for our customer. So, for example, as a CEO, I, I've, I've, I've signed on to, you know, uh, legislation to make sure that voting is available to all. Uh, we were we were very supportive of all of the different social causes that were experienced, you know, effectively with black culture, Asian culture. Um, and all of the injustice that we saw last, you know, the last couple of years. So we wanted to make sure that we were contributing and aligning um, our own uh, uh, dollars towards those charities and those causes that are really important to our team and our customers, as, as an example. Um, but, you know, we, we uh, as a company, since we reflect current culture, you know, you also see in the market itself the impact of certain events and what happens in the industry. And so, you know, we lost a once in a generation icon a couple of weeks ago in the passing of Virgil Abloh. Um, and, you know, we as a company felt it was really important to support what we thought, you know, were the things that were representative of what he was doing around creator and artists. And so we, uh, supported a charity that he was close to, but on the platform itself, what was what was really interesting is that you see the dynamic nature associated with demand and the supply reflected immediately on the platform um, with events that happen outside in the world. But then we see the impact of those events in terms of in terms of what's happening on our on our market, certainly from a demand perspective. Right. Right. Well, uh, got a bit of a sense of uh, StockX and, and where you are and, and a bit of where you're going. Now I want to get to know more about you. Um, and I like to go way back, start at the beginning. So tell me, uh, <laughs> where were you born? Um, parents, siblings? Yeah. Uh, born in Mountain View, California, right in the Silicon Valley before it was the Silicon Valley. Uh, but I mostly grew up in um, up in the state of Washington, just outside of Seattle. Uh, so grew up in the Northwest, um, you know, and, and I have five brothers and sisters. Um, so we were a motley, motley clan. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I, 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 I grew up a really strong family, family background, but, you know, if you were come to a meal at the Cutler household, even as adults, uh, there's a fight for the food that's on the table. <laughs> That that roast beef was passed around one time, and if you didn't get it on the first time, you were you were not going to eat. <laughs> so, so where are uh, you in the birth order? I'm number three, <laughs> right in the middle. All right, yeah, good. not quite the middle child, but yeah, a little, skewed a little bit more to the older side. To the yeah. older side. So, yeah. so you three know, boys, two, three boys, three older. girls. I was the oldest boy, <laughs> and the oldest boy. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. an interesting. 
dynamic. Uh, so um, most of you growing up in Washington then, wh what were you into? Um, the, the, yeah. Especially the, the current culture stuff of the time. Yeah. Well, you know, when I when I started at StockX, it was it, it was interesting. I I wore a pair of Adidas top tens to an all hand company meeting, and um, you know, Adidas top ten. It's an it's an OG sneaker. You know, in in Detroit, it's not one of the most collectible sneakers. But for me, when I was a kid, the reason that was the first sneaker that I bought more as an adult collector was more of the fact that that was a sixty four. $95 sneaker was way too expensive for me. And my parents were like, there's no way we're going to, you, you, there's no way you're going to wear a pair of top 10. So all I could afford was a pair of ponies. Uh, and so, and so for me, uh, sneakers, basketball goes back to when I, when, when I was a kid, but it represented something that was unattainable for me then. Uh, and, and so that was when I joined StockX, uh, I wore that, that particular, uh, sneaker, but I was, you know, I was into, uh, sports, a lot of the outdoors, what probably shaped me a lot in terms of my future career. Um, and maybe you've heard this from others, but I was a paper boy, uh, uh, which, which, uh, maybe for this audience, people don't know, I, I, you know, delivered physical papers to people's doors. <laughs> yeah, That's the how internet was. used to be <laughs> on dead trees Yes, <laughs> and it would have to be, it was child labor delivered yes, it yes. to people's doorsteps. It was very interesting. Yes. So from, you know, I can't remember, I think it was like a fourth grade until I was a senior in high school. I delivered papers every, I get up at 4 a.m. I rode my uh, I rode my bike uh, a number of miles away from home. I had to deliver those papers every day of the year, but but it instilled in me this uh, rising up early in the morning, which has always stayed with me. It instilled me a bit of the work ethic, although my mom always had to drive me around on the rainy days. I, I was I was not tough enough to do that, but it but it instilled in me just like the the work ethic uh, that's just been part of my life and my career at a really early age of, uh, of getting up and understanding or appreciating customer service, having to be somewhere at a certain time and, um, you know, and then, and then having to go around and collect uh, money from my customers every month was always a, always a tough experience. What's the cultural equivalent today of a paper route? Is there anything? I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's really hard uh, to find that type of, um, you know, that, that, that type of work that requires you to be somewhere every single day, maybe other than the farm today. Uh, where, you know, you, 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 there's no option to not show up at work. It's a job that has to get done every single day. I guess that would be maybe the, you know, the, 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 the equivalent, I guess, uh, today. Maybe, uh, maybe it's being a, a streamer on Twitch. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm not I'm not sure you have to show up to work every day at 4 a.m. streaming on Twitch. You're probably playing uh, until 4 a.m., but you're not certainly getting up at 4 a.m. to start your day. <laughs> so not the getting up piece, but, you know, with, with online content, you got to, yeah. you know, feed the beast. Um, yeah. So uh, t tell me what academically you were into. Uh, what, what was your mind really focused on mm -hmm. at the time as, as being important? Well, um, you know, when I, I my career aspiration early on was I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, which um, I, I I ditched uh, a couple of years into into college. That idea um, I majored in economics, uh, which interestingly enough is, is like perfectly represented in in my in my career. Uh, but I was. Um, you know, I did my undergrad in econ, and then I ended up going to law school. Why'd you and want to I, be a neurosurgeon? Um, you know, I, 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 I loved biology. I loved, um, you know, those were the science classes I, I loved as a, as a kid. And uh, my brother ended up being a, a head and neck surgeon. I look up to my, my, my younger brother who, who went down that path. But yeah, for, for a time, I thought, well, wouldn't that be really cool just to be in that field, intellectually challenging, helping people every day. Uh, but, 
you know, when I got to college, I, I really loved, I loved econ and I, I kind of stayed with that. What, what, was there an entrepreneurial piece to your love for econ? No, but I, I you know, in, in the sense that I, I, I've always been a student of markets and, you know, you, you learn really quickly in terms of what is the intersection of demand and supply, how that impacts pricing. Um, and then, you know, certainly in later in my career, when I spent nearly a decade at the New York Stock Exchange and seeing how financial markets, you know, work and operate at scale, you know, was, what, I guess, a continuation of a love or excitement or a passion that I saw of marketplaces going, you know, going back to my formative my formative college years. So um, you were in college at uh, Brigham Young mm -hmm. when you made yep. that shift. Uh, what else formative happened yeah. during that period? Um, yeah. Anything around leadership, around teams? Well, not leadership teams, actually. Something that's actually still part of a really important part of my life is um, I supported myself through college by uh, working in a, um, um, at a at a hospital, actually, um, with uh, people that were in psychiatric ward, depression ward, um, in in a hospital, and so I was I was in mental health, and that was just my my job during during college. And um, fast forward, um, you know. A long time later, I've been a part of a nonprofit organization called Vibrant Emotional Health that does a lot of things in the in the world of mental health. But one of the most exciting things is um, it supports the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And so I actually got involved with that charity because of how much I enjoyed working with with patients and in mental health in college. It wasn't my career, uh, but then I had a unique perspective on that, which allowed me to do a lot of really exciting, you know, exciting and, and really important work in mental health as a board member, as mm -hmm. part of a charity that today um, has grown really rapidly in terms of the time that I've been involved. But that was something that shaped me in college that came back you know, decades later as an opportunity to give back in an area that, you know, was not directly associated with my profession, uh, but very much connected with an early passion or excitement that I had in, in college. What, what brings a college student to work in mental health uh, in a hospital? That's not the typical college <laughs> job. Who, uh, who, who made that connection with you or what? Yeah, you know, it was uh, it was it was a well-paying job at the time. It was working a hospital, which I I was, you know, again going back to the desire potentially to be a doctor or something that I, I kind of had an affinity towards it. And then the the job posting was essentially just you know working uh, in you know I think it wasn't quite a secretary, but it was a lot of the administrative work in a in a behavioral health unit. And then I transitioned over into into actually working with, uh, you know, the, the the patients there, and I just really enjoyed the work. It was just, it was actually a, a, a great job to have, and I could work double shifts on the weekends, and I could get in a lot of hours that, you know, were not a typical job that I could actually work in college. So I, I would work that shift from 3 p.m. to 11. Uh, that kind of worked well going to college and then still I could able to go out at night, but work eight hours in the day. So I, I, I worked a lot during that time frame. Wow. Okay. And then, um, if you were so into econ, why'd you go to law school? Um, yeah, great, great question. At the, at the time when I was making that decision, uh, you know, I had a choice to move, move to New York. Uh, and to work for a consulting firm in New York. And I was, I grew up in Seattle. I had never been there. I'd never been to New York in my life at that point in time. I'd really only traveled maybe up to Canada and down to California to see family. And, and so I didn't have much of a, even when I graduated from, from college, I didn't have even a national or global perspective. And so when I went back to interview for that job in New York, 
you know, I felt like a country mouse. I was like, I, I don't even fit in, <laughs> in this. I couldn't imagine. And so uh, it was, you know, law school for me was almost a backstop to say, well, I think I'd still love some additional training and foundation in another area. And so I chose to go into law school. I still had a, a business focus. I ended up practicing as a corporate securities lawyer for about three years. But but even that was a great foundation for ultimately, you know, other aspects of my career going into investment banking or through the exchange. And, you know, that legal foundation has ended up to serve me actually pretty well because uh, most of the things that I've been involved in have been marketplaces, but there's been a real regulatory aspect to it. And that legal foundation turned out to be, a, you know, a, a, a great benefit for me later in my career. So let's fast forward to StubHub, right? Yes. It's really it's interesting to go from the New York Stock Exchange to StubHub. Yeah. Why why, why that leap? Well, I had spent uh, I was again I was coming up on on ten years, just over nine years. I really loved my experience at the at the exchange. It was during a time of the electronification of markets. I was really focused on. Uh, the trading, the capital markets, uh, part of the business globally, and was involved in, you know, really over the decade, the decade that I was there, almost a trillion dollar, over a trillion dollars of financings of some of the greatest companies in the world. Uh, but but after I had finished, um, my last IPO was was really the Alibaba IPO, and I, I really wanted to go back to my roots in technology. I wanted to go back to the West Coast. I felt as though the skill set that I had learned over those 10 years could be uniquely applied to a marketplace. And so I was looking for marketplace opportunity um, in technology. And um, and StubHub was at that time uh, really almost that perfect fit for me, um, although a totally different industry, the exact same principles of a marketplace just in a different industry. So it made a lot of sense for me to make that move. Um, not too long into your time there, eBay bought it. eBay bought it actually before I was I was there. So oh, okay, it was before. I, I joined in 2015. It was actually purchased by eBay in 2007. Oh, right. Um, and so, the, you know, the company had been around for 15 years before I was the, C, the before I was the CEO. And, you know, I'd say during my tenure there was probably defined most by some major partnerships with Major League Baseball, uh, the NFL, um, and a real change of the model in terms of the pricing model at, um, at StubHub that drove a lot of growth for that business, which was, we can go into it more detail, but was an observation learned from a multi-channel environment of the exchange of what it takes to win in a place where from financial markets, you are competing for that best order based on best price and best time. And I came into StubHub at a time where a lot of the supply was listing on multiple markets. And so in order to compete and to win, you had to be the best price at that best point in time. And so we changed the way things were priced on that marketplace and it led to a real substantial growth period for the company. So when you apply what you learned at uh, StubHub and eBay to StockX, what's the difference? Like what makes yeah. a good auction good versus frustrating? Um, you know, auctions on eBay at first, you know, in the early days were all the rage. And I think, uh, something about it sort of got stale, got old. Now people just want their stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Th does that happen to all auctions eventually, or is there some secret? Well, when, when StockX started, it started with this premise of building the next uh, commerce experience. But interesting to me was more that in their press release, they said it was based on the principles of the New York Stock Exchange, StubHub, and eBay. Um, and so I actually reached out to the company on the very first day 
because there's nobody else in the world that had my background. And I ended up being an, an advisor of sorts to the company as they were thinking about this, you know, this new model. But, but the reason that I believed actually back in 2016, three years before I even joined the company, why it was so disruptive to what I'd seen at StubHub and even what I'd seen at eBay was really just the customer experience. In, in one sense, you know, StubHub disrupted what was, you know, effectively tickets that were being listed on eBay and sold one ticket at a time. And if you were a user and you were going into an experience like that, you know, I, I'd want to go to a Knicks game. I'd have to search through every single ticket for every single game uh, to be able to find that one thing. And so what StubHub did that was innovative really was structure the unstructured. So it structured it around, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Knicks are playing the Heat. And it's on September, you know, it's on November 1st and it's in MSG arena. And I want to sit in this certain section and here's the seat. That experience of organizing and structuring all of that experience led to a transaction that you could actually get to very, very quickly and transact because you knew exactly what you wanted to do. Um, and it was also a, an experience that was really designed for event going experiences. So Think of unstructured peer-to-peer -peer moving to a very structured world in a particular vertical, and you can invest in that vertical experience. And so what, 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 what StockX, in terms of the extension of the learnings of those other things, you know, in the categories that we had, is just a more of a fundamental belief that instead of auctions, we wanted to run a real-time marketplace that looks a lot more like the New York Stock Exchange, where you know, things are trading constantly An auction never ends or never begins. Trading is always happening. We also had a really strong view that instead of, you know, a thousand uh, listings or images of the same product that we would create one single product page against which all buyers and all sellers would interact in one common centralized market. And then what was you know, the, the challenge associated with most marketplace experiences today, and this is true across content, it's true across ride sharing, it's even true across um, uh, uh, vacations or things like this, is it still is a listings-based world where you've got to sort through all of these listings, do a lot of work to get to what you want, and you've got to overcome the trust barrier associated with transacting somebody you don't know. And so the the next level of innovation with StockX is standing in the middle of the seller and their buyer and authenticating every single product on the platform to eliminate that uh, distrust that you could have in buying a mark in, in a marketplace and create an experience where I know what I want, I can see the value of what it's trading for in a real-time market, and I have 100% trust and confidence that I'm going to get exactly what I paid for. That combination of things is really not available in any marketplace experience. And it's really the driving reason behind why StockX has been successful with consumers in the categories that, that, we, that we trade. Right. Uh, so tell me about reaching out to the founders when StockX first um, launched. What... What was the response? What when did you first meet them? Yeah, I think they first thought I was a spy. That I was like, you know, a spy from from eBay or from StubHub, trying to figure out what they were doing. I was actually just genuinely interested in the sneaker category at that time. But I was generally interested with this approach. I like this is really an innovative way to approach data. So I reached out uh, to Josh Luber. Uh, who was the CEO via LinkedIn. Um, Josh and I connected. I ended up meeting and talking with Josh. Uh, Dan Gilbert, uh, who is the founder of, of Rocket Mortgage, owns the Cavs. Greg Schwartz, who is one of the, the co-founders, and had a discussion like, this is a really innovative idea. And, um, you know, and again, some of the observations that they were thinking about uh, in terms of, where the market could go. I was very intellectually curious about this new model. 
um, and and really wanted to wanted to wanted to see how this was going to evolve. And so I truly thought it was innovative then, and I I still think we're in the early days of delivering on that early promise why, of a, a new a new commerce experience. Why sneakers? Why do you think of all the things in culture in society of all the I mean, for eBay early on, I don't know if there's a single thing, but you know, baseball yeah. cards, Beanie yeah. Babies for a while. Why in the 20 teens is it sneakers? Well, I mean, even when you look at, you know, eBay services so many different verticals from parts and accessories to cars and autos to home and garden, electronics, apparel. So there are tons of categories in, in marketplaces. Um, and, you know, I think um, the reason starting with sneakers was more that if you if you look at kind of that analogy that I went through with with StubHub, there's there's a lot of unstructured approach to a very passionate community and people were trading uh, sneakers going back to the original Jordans in 85. And so there was a really passionate community. Um, the way things traded was not centralized or understood. Uh, trust was a big problem in the in the marketplace, um, and so creating a centralized marketplace that, that had created the visibility as to what these items were worth, and amplifying you know the ability to gain access to this product in a trusted, transparent way, uh, what was really transformational for the sneaker uh, community and marketplace. Um, and it led to a lot more velocity of, of, of trading and passion. And then it just so happens, you know, kind of at the same time, and StockX had a role to play in this, but at the same time, you saw a massive convergence between sneakers, streetwear, fashion, high fashion, technology, and then and then social, all that was a perfect storm for current culture that's created now you know a real appreciation particularly for the younger generation that now these are assets these are investment opportunities this is not just about consuming but this is about trading and investing in an exciting new asset class and that's certainly something that we're, where we play at the center you know of that but we're seeing some of these major major trends that uh, are impacting the way this generation shops and consumes, you know, that that certainly we as a company are cognizant of and have de designed our experience around. Rihanna, Kanye West, Jay-Z. <laughs> yeah. Because right? yeah. we're talking about culture and we're talking about StockX. Yeah. And the reason why I bring them up is because um, we used to, I think, think about well, somebody's famous for one thing, and then they have a fashion line, and isn't that yeah. cute? You yeah. know, uh, Rockaware or you know Yeezys, or but but suddenly they're billionaires, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, what what has shifted, changed in culture? And it's not, I guess, just about leveraging brand. There's also, I guess, a level of intelligence, sensitivity that maybe certain entrepreneurs, certain people, including those I mentioned, have that is relevant across multiple endeavors, maybe? Yes. What, yes. What's, what's the link to the culture and the markets that they're creating? Because in part, that's what they're doing, yes. is they're creating markets around the, the content um, and, and items and apparel, whatever it is uh, that, that they're creating. Design, uh, creativity, relevancy, uh, taste, driving culture uh, because of the position across um uh, you know uh, uh, across fashion across music you know potentially across sports um again all of these themes coming coming together you know and and it's it's not that new but it's just been you know amplified it's the you know the 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 magnitude of the of the change is so dramatic i mean it's not the first time that a brand has collaborated with an athlete. I mean, Jordan brand is probably one of the best examples of how an athlete transcended sport to become a brand, to become something way bigger uh, that that continues. But now you see 
um, artists that are moving over into fashion and then they're doing collaborations with the biggest brands and then they become the designers of the biggest brand houses and then they're also some of the largest influencers of culture in the world and they're creating their own companies and their own brands but they're also influencing all culture around it with the power of of their voice and their view and their and their opinion and perspective and so you know what we're seeing here is a little bit of you know this new power center that's focused on the creators not just the brand but it's the creators who have the power the creators who are driving the economics the creators that are driving the trend and and that's a new shift in the power dynamics of how the economy works and where the true economics are are being created and a real opportunity is being created that I think is leveling the playing field maybe that we've never seen before towards the creator. And I think it's just so dynamic and so exciting. Uh, it, it really is something. Now, I always like to ask about an experience that I call Death Valley, lowest point, because um, I think there are lessons in how one gets through that. And it could be a, a personal Death Valley, it could be a career Death Valley, but have you had um, a, a moment, an experience that, you know, you thought whatever you had been working toward was hitting a wall and um, you were going to have to do something entirely different? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, growing up in the Northwest, I was always in the mountains and um, had a family that spent a lot of times in the mountains. And, um, and so I've spent, um, I find a lot of enjoyment still uh, pushing myself to climb peaks, ski peaks, uh, do things like that. Um, I, I once found myself stuck on the side of a mountain uh, and a choice to make uh, where I could die or dig a snow cave to stay alive and, and keep myself alive. And I, 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 I've told this story a number of different times and it's, it's a longer story, but the point of the story was there was this really very, very clear choice of do nothing and die or do something and live. And there was something at the center of me that says, I'm not only going to do something like I'm going to work to dig in at that moment to live another day. I go back to that experience a lot. I tell a story a lot about just the importance at times where you can be in a very hopeless position. It can feel like it's over. And with a lot of you know perseverance and faith in yourself to like to dig in at that moment you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the opportunity in my life po post that moment of digging in has been great, but that's always been kind of a, a center experience for me in my life. Okay. Uh, and it was a near death experience as well. So I guess it makes it a little bit sharper. <laughs> so I asked death Valley, I got death mountain. I got to exactly. ask for some more, uh, details here. When was this? Um, and how do you get stuck on, on the side of a mountain? What went wrong? It, it was, uh, it was um, in the mid '90s. I was climbing Mount Hood in Oregon in the spring with a friend. Uh, climbed up, and I was skiing down. And uh, an, a, a rule in climbing is you never leave your partner, never leave your wingman. I was going to ski down, and and the way it happened is a, a storm came in. I got caught in a whiteout. I got separated from my from my friend and got stuck in the middle of a, you know, of a, a very glaciated valley um, that that now in global warming doesn't exist, but there were a lot of glaciers on that mountain. I got stuck in one and I had to, I literally had to dig a snow cave. Uh, so that was in the, in the mid nineties. With what? I mean, if you were going to ski down, I don't imagine you had a shovel on you. I, I had to dig a cave with the, with essentially a spoon, which is the back of an ice axe. Uh, it's all, it's all, it's all I had. I didn't have a shovel. I had my ice axe and I, and I, and I, and I dug a cave that I could crawl into with an ice, with an ice axe had uh, about a quarter of an, of a Nalgene bottle that was frozen and about a quarter of a sleeve of fig Newtons <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that helped me make it through. And I, I got as a harrowing rescue, but 
um, I got discovered and we found our way out in the middle of the storm. It was, it was a wild, wild experience. Yeah. I, and I, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a, a storyteller and a story listener, so I got to get the full thing. So um, what was it hard to find? Did you have to do something in order to be found or was it yes. just happenstance? Well, yeah. So there's no way for me, it's not happenstance. Um, you know, I, I dug a cave on a side of a mountain in a whiteout. I put my skis at a cross at the entrance of my, of my snow cave. And, um, and at the very end of the day, I had been stuck for, you know, 12 or more hours. And I was, um, you know, looking at the next three days of storms. I, I didn't think I was going to make it out. And two other climbers that had summited the mountain, but had got lost and stranded, wound up uh, finding me, coming across, cr coming across me. But the important part of the story is that I had, they had an altimeter and, and I had a map oh. and a compass. And it was the combination of those three things that allowed us to know where we were and to map a course out. And because all three of us had some component of the of the rubric of what it was going to take to get out, we were able to get out of that place on the mountain, find our way back uh, to Timberline Lodge, is at kind of at the top of this mountain, and survive. Uh, they were in as bad a condition as I was. Yeah, uh, but it was the combination of those things. But but imagine just to like ski off the side of a mountain, dig a hole, have two other people randomly go off the mountain and happily find you. That is kind of like the, the likelihood of that coming out as a successful outcome. It, it did for me that day, but I think the chances were very slim that that was going to happen. That's one of those, you know, Dr. Strange, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, infinity war to end game sort of, I, yeah. I see one scenario where this works out. Um, yeah. if, if another couple people get stranded and have an altimeter on yeah. them. So you didn't get rescued exactly. You, no, you rescued yeah. each other. Yes. Yes, we did. Yes. The combination of, of the three of us were able to rope up and take some bearings and, uh, and find our way, find our way out. How does that experience, maybe how does, how did that experience affect you after that? I mean, aside from, you, you're probably not skiing down any mountains alone after that. But um, when it comes to uh, running into strangers, people in need of help, or <laughs> the way you think about challenges, you talked about the digging in piece, but is there more? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm a person of faith. And so I didn't, I didn't think it was pure coincidence, uh, number one. Um, and that, that, that faith carries me through a lot of different things in, in you know, in, in my life. Uh, number two, just the gift of life um, and and the gift of, of being in that in that moment is something that I'm always strive to get to that that place of of appreciation for the um, for the for the for the blessing of that of that moment, you know. And then and then third, it's just it's just really, you know, just that that simple idea of uh, something that I talk about. Um, in management and in leadership, which is that element of choice where uh, I think Stephen Covey said it, you know, between stimulus and response lies your ability to choose. Here in that case, I'm in a, in a death-like situation. I certainly have a choice and it definitely impacted the outcome of, of what ultimately happened. And I think we as individuals and leaders are constantly facing situations where we certainly don't control what happens to us um, and we have choice for what we're going to do uh, in that moment and that 100% can impact uh, the outcome. And so it's part of being responsible in that choice of what you can make um, that, 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 that I believe is an incredible power that nobody can take away from us that um, if you you know make uh, the right the right choices can certainly impact the outcomes of your of your life. Wow, um, 
What a story. And this is the mid-90s, so you're um, pretty fresh out of college. Yeah. I, I was in between uh, undergrad and law school at that time. It was the summer in, so the summer in between. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so uh, back to StockX now. Yeah. Um, tell me what the, the next kind of 2022 and beyond – um, strategic either shift or build is. You're in more product categories now. You're creating this marketplace in culture, of culture. You're doing partnerships, um, even around kind of creating new uh, types of products. What of all those things is most important for you to build on? Yeah. So, you know, as, as, I, as I started being a trusted global platform, your trust is at the center of everything we do. So delivering a great customer experience and a trusted customer experience is, is, is number one. You know, we also talk about consuming and trading, um, which is, you know, both the idea that we can be a platform for personal expression and to wear or to consume the items that trade in our catalog. But we're also very strategically look at you know, the world, and it's informed by our customers that 40% um, uh, of our customers come to StockX with the intent to invest. And so we think there's a big opportunity to unlock the investment idea around StockX. And then it really is about being staying in current culture. And I, I define what current culture is for us, but as we look at current culture and we look at how that's expressed around the world, we have this really unique opportunity to do that servicing our international customers and servicing our customers beyond our current categories and expanding within our current categories. And that really is our, our strategy uh, in terms of what we're executing on as a company around international category expansion, really focused on what the what the digital uh, future uh, can look like, all while keeping that, you know, next generation customer at the center of the experience and the center of our minds and everything that we want to create for them. Speaking of digital experiences, how much are you thinking about NFTs and the metaverse? Yeah, well, it's it's a really exciting. I mean, you know, everybody talks about it as as three of you know modern technology wave and i certainly believe uh, in that i think our Which part the, the, well you know do, I, do you separate nfts in the and whatever the well, metaverse is for for you if, if it's you know th yeah. this deal that that nike just did um sure. in digital sneakers i mean is that is that real for you well i mean i think there are a, a couple of the major trends one from a financial perspective the decentralization of currency and finance um, that's really defined in the crypto world is is really interesting and, and here to stay. I mean, there's going to be a lot of volatility, a lot of learning, um, but, um, but that's certainly uh, something that really plays into this idea that, you know, I kind of talked about with, uh, you know, what you talked, what we talked about is just the creators, but this create, powering the creator economy in a decentralized world is, is a really exciting opportunity in and of itself. And then when you layer on top of that, this idea that uh, we have these digital worlds that we exist in or that we transact in or that we're fluidly moving through and the idea that something that's relevant in our physical world carries into this digital world is, is something that um, is, is super exciting. And um, yes, all the discussion today is about the about, about the metaverse, but but just but but transacting and acting and consuming in a world that's defined by different rules is a revolution in finance. It's a revolution in commerce. It's a revolution in 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 the way we interact, and it's unlocking a tremendous wave of investment and intellectual curiosity about it about a different digital world that's defined with different rules than the way we currently operate today. So massively disruptive, huge opportunities, and big winners and big losers uh, in, this, in this new uh, disruptive world.
So what do you practically do? I mean, do you start accepting cryptocurrencies in the items that you create uh, as StockX? Do you issue NFTs along with those? Um, are they useful for authentication since that's trust is such an important part of your business? Where do you move first? So the, the, there's certainly as a as a platform of current culture, um, NFT is an example of a purely digital asset that could trade in a marketplace like ours on top of the traffic that we have a platform for, where as a platform we're built with stock large stock large stock market like mechanics. You know, we think there's a, a really exciting opportunity for digital assets to trade on the platform itself. Um, but as I said before, we also know that our consumer is also an investor in these new asset classes that you and I have talked about, whether it be sneakers, trading cards, collectibles, apparel, electronics. There's this new asset class that today, if you want to be an investor in that physical asset class, uh, you have to be the custodian of that product, means you need to have it in your closet. You have to actually move it between seller and buyer. And so there's a there's a lot of friction and cost and risk associated with being a investor in items that have to move around physically. And so I, I think what we certainly believe is that we have all this infrastructure around current culture of knowing the ability of how to authentically move physical product between buyer and seller. And we think there's a great opportunity to create different experiences that can be digital experiences that are tied to that physical asset that can be unlocked in tokens or NFTs or different types of, uh, of, of, of digital um, assets, but that could be also linked to the, to the physical world. And so I think as we look at the future, we think it's gonna be one of both digital and phys physical and we're going to play in both in a converged, bridged way. Amazing. Scott, uh, thanks for sharing about StockX and the direction that you're heading in and, uh, and about yourself and the experiences that, that got you here. Scott Cutler, CEO of StockX. Thanks so much.